Thanks, for, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, I'm really excited to have um, this group here to talk about open source and Python. Um, I'm gonna let each uh, individual uh, introduce themselves, but I'll give a quick introduc introduction for my, myself before we get going. So I'm Xander. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Bitewax. We do <coughs> uh, Python uh, open source stream processing um, project, if you wanna check it out. Um, I'm from Santa Cruz, and I'm excited to be here. This is my first time at PyData Seattle, but I've been to some other PyData events, and this is pretty awesome. So I'll turn it over and let them all introduce uh, themselves, and then we kind of have a couple topics we're gonna talk about, um, and we'll see how the time goes. If we have time, I uh, hope to open it up for a couple questions, but the debate might get fierce, so we might not have enough time. Um, hi everyone, I'm Juanita. Uh, I am a PhD student at EUC Santa Cruz and on my free time I am also the community manager for the Scientific Python project. Um, so it aims to basically coordinate and integrate the Scientific Python ecosystem, sort of like bring together the libraries and find ways to um, sort of make it easier for us to coordinate. Um, and I met Sander in Santa Cruz <laughs> a few months ago, and I'm very excited uh, about documentation and community building within open source, so I'm hoping to talk about that a little bit today. Um, I'm Hamil Hussein. I work on a lot of open source projects, uh, maintain a wide variety of open source projects. Uh, one that I've been involved with recently is called NBDev. It's a uh, project that allows you to write, distribute, and test Python packages from Jupyter Notebooks. So if that sounds crazy or sounds interesting, give it a shot. Hi, I'm Stefan Kraftchik, the CEO and founder of Dagwix. Uh, at Dagwix, we're uh, trying to uh, solve the pain that you feel when you inherit someone else's model pipeline code. Um, uh, we uh, are driving an open source project called Hamilton, which I uh, created at, at Stitch Fix, which is essentially an opinionated way to, to write Python uh, that helps with that. Otherwise, yeah, I'm based in San Francisco, so excited to be at my first in-person uh, PyData. Uh, and uh, my introduction to, to Python was uh, way back in the day uh, at grad school, but I didn't really pick it up until uh, I had to use it for work. So, thanks. Uh, my My name is Katrina Reel. Um, I'm the president of the board of directors for NumFocus. Hopefully all of you know who NumFocus is. We are the fiscal entity for most, like about 60 projects in the PyData ecosystem, about 50 affiliated projects. And we also put on the PyData conferences, so you're all at our event. Um, and um, I'm also an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University. And I just recently became the maintainer of the PyViz project. Um, I've been around in the community for a really long time. Um, I started using Python in about 1998 and uh, made the rounds at all the usual suspects from Nthought to Anaconda to everywhere. So um, I recently retired and so I am here just uh, hanging out and hopefully going to attend as many PyData events as I possibly can and uh, do open source. So that is my whole story. All right, so what I want to get started here with is you all have been um, involved in the Python ecosystem in one way or another for a long time. Um, and I want to touch, or I want you all to touch on some of the trends uh, that you see today that are really impacting um, the Python ecosystem. Uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about areas that you, don't, that you think don't receive su sufficient support today. Um, and Anyone can jump in and uh, take it to start. Okay, I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> um, I'm just coming from PyCon, so I have a whole lot of uh, juice on this one, actually. Um, you know, I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit in the sense that, you know, Python's been around for a while now, right? Um, it's, you know, created in, what, 1991. Um, it's got a large community around it now. Um, there's a point in time where you start to wonder, okay, is this too big? Has this become too big a library? Do we have too many things in the standard library? Have we moved in too many different directions? 
is Python the right solution for a lot of the applications that we're working on right now, right? I think that one person put it really, really well that, you know, Python is good for a lot of things, but it's not necessarily the best tool for everything, right? And so, um, is there a chance here, like, has our standard library gotten too big? Do we have too many different ways for us to do the same thing, right? For example, uh, don't get me started on threads and async IO and all of the fun stuff going on there, right? Um, is this really necessary? And do we have enough consensus in our community in order to move together in one direction? Also, this happens also in the scientific community. And I'm just gonna say that, you know, the big bomb in the scientific community is data science, right? This is big business. This has come in and really uh, using a lot of the tools that have been out there in the SciPy community for a long time, which were primarily, you know, developed mostly by physicists and geophysicists and bench scientists, right? And so when we're moving into this new area, where's the science going? Right? Are we still supporting the scientific community as well as we could? And are we also uh, you know, moving in the right direction for supporting these, these companies <laughs> and a lot of the data science that's going on? And what does that relationship look like? There is a lot of gap between the support in both of those areas. And where does that line belong? And are we really in the position where we want people giving their free time and doing free work on open source software so that others can make millions and billions of dollars off of it, right? So um, I'm just gonna start there. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, so uh, having worked at St Stitch Fix for close to six years, I was gonna say, off of the, the data science thing, uh, yeah, the, the ecosystem of tooling for you know, doing machine learning has gone so much better. Um, and so I've, uh, I've definitely been one of those who have uh, 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 not taken advantage, but uh, utilized all the open source uh, things to help data scientists and you know, obviously the company at Stitch Fix um, make more money. Um, and so I think uh, for me in my career, I've really seen uh, the, uh, the machine learning side and also the data side um, uh, really also gravitate towards Python. So that means a lot of the glue languages and the glue code, Python actually becomes a really uh, uh, a great way to glue things together. Um, uh, and then uh, in terms of you know, gaps and things, uh, having tried to build tooling for data scientists, it's really packaging. It's really still, I think, something that <laughs> Python could do a much better job of. Uh, if you compare it to other languages like Go or something, which make it kind of really easy to kind of build something and, and distribute it, Python has like so many ways. And so when I look at someone who has, who's using poetry versus Basil, I kind of, you know, my eyes glaze over and I really just want something super simple. But um, otherwise, you know, that, that's kind of my experience of the trends of, uh, uh, with, uh, with Python right now. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, related to what you were mentioning, that maybe this sort of... Um, like trend of guiding into different directions is caused by the fact that there's not like an awareness of the tools that there are and maybe some sort of um, materials that help us learn how to integrate them together and how to um, make like a, like a coherent workflow with each of these tools. Um, and so I, w I, w I wanted to say that maybe one of these gaps uh, within the Python ecosystem, it's, um, these like tutorials or documentation regarding like how to use these tools that we're building and how to integrate it in our workflow together. Like why not, um, yeah, maybe there are documentation for each of the libraries, not by side by like there's a bunch of documentation for all of them, but is there materials that can help me do something specifically with all of them together and how to like make my workflow easier by using them all and not like reinventing the wheel? Um, of like creating a new package that, that, that does everything that all of them together do. Um, and the other thing that it's also related to this is, um, I think by this point that we have like so many libraries, coordination between them would be like important in the sense that um, why does each one of the Python libraries has to have their own, I don't know, documentation, theme, um, why not just have one theme and then like we all coordinate and we use them together and uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I'm pushing towards this idea of like working together, integrating the the libraries to be like a a bigger group. It might be very hard because there's a bunch of them, 
Um, but I think we can start somewhere on like coordinating on this like little things that can make it easier to find like a single workflow with all of them. Yeah, I agree with everything that was said. Um, you know, two kind of pain points that I keep coming across out of all the companies I work for and various open source projects is, you know, is packaging and documentation systems. And like documentation systems are especially painful. Um, you know, every project kind of tries to go down their own path. You know, there's Sphinx, but People want, you know, beautiful, modern-looking documentation. They want kind of features that support things like Jupyter Notebooks in them and all kinds of stuff. And it's kind of a mess to, you know, everyone ends up rolling their own documentation system. Uh, and I think, yeah, that, that's one thing that bothers me a lot personally because I think documentation is extremely important. And... Uh, do each of you have a uh, particular um, project uh, or Python library that's um, uh, particularly exciting for you right now? And you can't just uh, shell out whatever it is you're working on. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm part of the scientific Python project, so I'm, of course, biased. Uh, but I think that the... This is like a very good opportunity to start this like integration. So right now we're working on uh, something called like specs, which is similar to like NEPS or like all this uh, specification documents for libraries. But this is something that we want to do in a more general sense that w would work for like more than one library. And we're working on like a system where the libraries can like vote for like whatever policies they think would like favor them. And I think this is like a very excitement, like start point towards this integration. Um, I, I, I think also the sort of involving the community in this process, it's very important too. So I'm very excited about what I'm doing right now, actually. Yeah, I guess it's unfair to ask me my, what my favorite Python the packages are what I'm most excited about. So, okay, MB Dev is really exciting to me because, um, you know, right now when you write Python code, you kind of have to live in two worlds. You live in your REPL and then the IDE. And you kind of have to context switch between those. And I think that's a really painful experience. And MB Dev offers like a window in, into which both worlds can coexist in a really interesting way. And it's very experiential. It's hard for me to even explain it. You have to experience it. Even if you don't use MBDEV, I recommend kind of playing with it so you can experience that modality. And it's not just about rep, REPL and um, you know, your IDE and context switching. It's also a documentation system. And so, yeah, like, uh, you know, like building documentation into to your workflow as a first class thing is you know is is really cool too, um, and so there's another project that's correlated um, called Quarto, which I'm really excited about. It integrates a lot of you know scientific uh, kind of publishing, computing allows you to generate document documentation in various formats, um, but you know and it supports notebooks and all kinds of other stuff, and it's very rich in its sort of functionality. And yeah, I've uh, helped people produce documentation sites with it already um, that are, that's very customized and beautiful and you know, works well with Python. And so uh, MB Dev is also built on top of that too, which is why I mentioned it. So th yeah, those are two things I'm kind of excited about. So I'm pretty utilitarian, so I guess it's hard to get me excited, but uh, um, when I'm thinking, or at least building Python projects, actually, I, uh, one of the, the packages I always use and have is Black. Uh, so Black is the, the format, and I think uh, related to you know how you structure and manage code, having something that takes takes a lot of the uh, opinion or well, provides an opinion, uh, stops fights between people or even people over code. So um, you know that's at least you know uh, one of my favorite libraries, I guess, in Python. Uh, you know, I'm happy to evangelize. 
As the president of the board of directors of NumFocus, I feel like I should not talk about which one are my favorite projects. I think that all 20, 120 of our projects are amazing. They are all doing fantastic things. Um, but I will actually uh, go outside of that a little bit. The projects I honestly have been keeping my eye on quite a bit are PyScript is one of them that I think is just absolutely amazing what they're doing over there. As a result of that, also PyDide is just under the hood of PyScript. They're also doing a lot of really, really cool things. Um, Vizu is actually one I've been keeping my eyes on. I know that, uh, yeah, there you are. <laughs> like, I don't know how many of y'all caught that tutorial, but we've been talking for a little bit. I think there are some amazing things happening over on that project. Um, and then also just as far as like code quality and linters and things like that, Rough is actually my, my uh, favorite thing right now. It's uh, taking the place of so many things in my tool stack um, that I just have to shout that one out. Rough is amazing. Right on. So, uh, Katrina, you mentioned a little earlier um, about you know how long Python's been around for and how big it has become. Um, you know, it's been one of the fastest growing languages and ranks top five on whatever analysis or um, site you look at. It's in the top five for most widely used languages. Um, why do you, each one of you, um, why do you think that is? What are some insights into why Python has become as widely adopted as it has become. Yeah, go ahead. Did you want me? Okay. Um, so I actually was thinking about this quite a bit during PyCon. Guido actually was talking about in his uh, closing arguments, or arguments, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, he was talking about uh, that Python is the people's programming language. I think that's a really, really good way to put it. It's the accessibility, it's the community, it's the ability to be able to extend the language. It's the ability to be able to do really whatever you want within Python, and which is one of the things that really attracted me to it, right? Was that suddenly I was in the position where, you know, Python is so closely tied to the open source community that I was really only bound by my, the amount of time I was willing to take to try to do something. <laughs> Right? It was easily extensible, it was easy to work with, it was easy to learn, easy to explain, all of those things like that, even if it wasn't necessarily the fastest, right? or it wasn't necessarily the right tool that was needed for absolutely every job, but it was something that came about through the work of a lot of people. <coughs> And I also look at this also the you know the the size of the community and also the size of the libraries, the size of you know the whole PyData ecosystem, the standard library, all these things like that. I actually think, to be quite honest, is a is a positive thing, right? This is the independent spirit of open source at work, right? Is that the whole idea behind open source is that if you have an idea, you can run with it that you're able to take your ideas and create them and put them out there and put those ideas out for everybody else. And somehow, you know, our collective brain trust, we get to better solutions over time. And so when I look at something like this, I, I look at the fact that this is going to continue, that we're gonna to continue to get better, that there are going to be solutions that come out of there. There is a possibility that, you know, they'll clean out the standard library someday. But it, this is, uh, I think that the, all of the mechanisms are in place for us to be able to continue to move forward that way. But I'll stop there. Yeah, um, so yeah, for me, when I was reflecting on this question or thinking about it, um, uh, the one thing that came to mind is job interviews. Uh, so one thing that really stuck for me was that uh, Python, you, could, it's, you can be really concise and really fast at expressing something that you can't in other languages. Uh, and that really ha uh, uh, was hammered home to me when I was on the interview circuit, you know, ten a decade ago, uh, you know, five, six years ago, right? That um, uh, Python is a great is a great interview language because if you can do things shorter uh, and write it out sooner and faster, your interview perception is much better because you've completed the task much sooner. And so to me, that really speaks to the strengths of Python is that you can actually write uh, uh, code quickly, have it be understandable, and to really, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, the fastest way from your know, brain to computer, right, is, you know, Python is one, a pretty good way to express yourself. Uh, the other is, uh, um, you know, the one reason, another reason to add on to uh, what Katrina was saying, the, why it's so large is this ecosystem, right? Uh, in, you know, in the last decade, it's just gotten bigger and bigger. I remember, you know, 
Python 2, uh, right, and all the issues with it, but in Python 3, I feel like things really accelerated. Um, uh, and so it, it's been you know, great to see. Uh, for people who have been building kind of internal uh, companies, you have to pick a language, right? And you have to uh, uh, choose a language that you want your team to use and orientate around. And so, like, one of the, it's a bit of, I think, a network effect as rich get richer. Because of Python's ecosystem, it's hard to bet against it because there's generally going to be some solution or something there within the ecosystem uh, that can solve your problem. And so I think it's, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's been snowballing, I guess, on itself. So. Yeah, I've, I've heard it all this phrase that um, people come for the language, but they stay for the community. And I think that's absolutely true. I think that Python, it's like a like relatively easy language to learn. Like that's, um, it has like a lot of advantages in terms of like the language itself. But I feel like, at least in my case, I well, I made Python and I started coming to these events, and it kind of it's kind of really easy to get very inspired to what people are doing here. Like you meet amazing people, you meet the maintainers of your favorite libraries, and you're like, wow, I can be, I can do that. I can, I can start building my own stuff, and that doesn't happen in like all the ecosystems. Like this is like super um, cool about the Python ecosystem is to come to PyData or SciPy or PyCon and meet these amazing people and just like be able to know that you can build your, your things your on, on your own and get the help from people. Like I, I, I remember that one of the like most memorable experience for me was this, the sprints at like a SciPy or something because that's the, the first time that I actually knew that I was actually going to be able to do something by myself, you know, like build my own library. So I think that um, the community in, in the Python ecosystem is amazing, and that's what makes it growing like faster. I don't think I have anything to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, so at this point, I want to switch gears just a little bit uh, and start talking a bit more about open source. Uh, and I want to start with the topic of funding um, and, and uh, I think it would be neat for you all to share um, some experiences and then maybe some opinions you have on um, issues with funding for open source projects and then maybe some solutions um, that you've thought of or you're currently approaching with something you're building potentially. Thanks. Yeah, I think about this every day. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't know if there's like a great set of solutions that I've stumbled upon as far as funding for open source. I mean, you know, so like, you know, like maintaining an open source project can a lot of times feel like a very thankless task. I mean, it's an initial high when you release a project, but then very quickly, you know, you're like maintaining issues and, you know, you're doing it for free. And so, um, you know, the topic of funding definitely comes up a lot. We've tried like many different things. Um, so MBDev is currently in this GitHub Accelerator program. So we had some, you know, sponsorship from GitHub. Um, you know, tried consulting around that. I've done that for a bit. Um, definitely thought about, you know, sort of having some commercial entity around it as well. Um, so I've explored all of those things. Um, I haven't really explored the commercial entity yet. Um, you know, this probably Xander or or some of these other folks can talk about it. But yeah, I, I actually don't have a great answer to that. Um, it is seems like a, it does seem like a problem in some sense. I I wish that there would be more of a marketplace for let's say you know uh, maintainers to to like transact with people. Um, you know, right now, kind of on our own to sort of find funding, and I don't think sponsors is not like GitHub sponsors or something like that is is you know not enough. Uh, I think there could be richer types of modalities in which we could transact with each other. I think maybe, um, well, this is just my thoughts, but maybe the lack of funding comes from like the lack of awareness of how important like most of these libraries are. Like I feel like there's a lot of companies and projects that make tons of money by using like scientific Python libraries, like like all the 
Python packages available that are, are open source. And the money that they give to open source is not like comparable to that, right? So they they have a lot of money that they make using our libraries for free, but they, they don't contribute the same way. And I feel like it's like, a, yeah, they, they, they don't recognize how important it is to like use these libraries. And I, I have been lucky of being able to uh, be funded for working in open source. And I think there's like very nice um, like initiatives and grants and like there's stuff out there that you can use to fund open source work. Um, but the amount of use that it has, it's not comparable to the amount of money that it receives to be worked on. So I think that it's a tremendous gap. I don't have a solution <laughs> for it. I think that um, there should be a way of, I don't know, making making more clear out there like the the importance of how many times a library has been used for like doing X or Y thing. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a really like bad gap between the money that you produce with open source and the money that you get for funding open source work. Yeah, I was going to say, the, the awareness, uh, I think, is uh, me candidly being pretty ignorant. I want to say, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of yeah, which, which projects that I use would want more funding. Uh, so I definitely think there's a bit of an awareness issue. Uh, the other is that uh, there's a lot of open source projects that are in very different states. Uh, which I think also complicates a bit of the issue. So I don't know we, we're using um, some guy's you know React component that he's done on his spare time. Like uh, he has a little sponsor button, like, uh, and we know uh, he's put it on his page that like you know he, he, it's just him, right? And so uh, it helps a little bit with the awareness. But then there's yeah you know, projects like you know like NumPy. I have no idea you know how I could contribute or what sponsorship would entail or, or anything like that. So I think there's a bit of a uh, uh, you know a disconnect there. Uh, and then there's the um, uh, I mean the best is having you know some company spin something out, uh, but obviously then uh, you know and if they can devote time to it then. And, you know that uh, to use it as branding, I think. Um, so Stitch Fix, where I used to work, that's one of the reasons why you know um, they were excited to open source things because it helped with branding, and so they were excited to kind of devote some time there. But those things don't last forever, so potentially you know that funding source uh, dries up, and so uh, you might you know want to use some library from some company, but unfortunately that maintainer left, and so no one's there who wants to kind of drive forward within that organization, uh, getting that time and resources. So. Uh, um, yeah, hard problem, heterogeneity, heterogeneity of you know, where the projects come from is part of it, but otherwise, I don't know, excited to hear what Katrina might say. I was just going to say, if you want to give money to NumPy, you're <laughs> welcome to go to the NumFocus website and give money to NumPy. We are their <laughs> fiscal sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I have a lot to say about this, actually, because before I was president of the board of directors, I was actually the treasurer for NumFocus, by the way. So I've seen kind of where the bodies are buried here. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, I think it's kind of amazing when you look at the impact that open source has had out there in the world, in some cases even, you know, driving whole parts of the economy, how difficult it is for us to find sustainable funding for open source projects. And I think that also people are very surprised when they find out in some cases how brittle an open source project might be. If you have 10 core developers that are all working on a project that could be a huge part of your company's infrastructure, but not anything is actually going into that project. No one's making sure that the uh, sustainability of that project is taken into consideration when they look at you know, using that or having that dependency in their stack. And so, I also, and I think people are always really surprised by this, by the way, because I'm constantly out stumping for money, by the way, for all of the projects that are under our umbrella um, and within the community. Everyone assumes that, you know, everyone is super rich, right? <laughs> that NumPy is obviously so well used and everyone is you know, aware of this, that like all of these people must be making, you know, half a million dollars a year and everything is just going absolutely beautifully which is not the case. In a lot of cases, most open source uh, developers are making below average salaries in order to support these things. And it's also a scramble every single year to even bring in the money to be able to support those people, right? 
And then you have the other ones that have the lesser projects, the smaller projects, where people are just doing this in their spare time. That they're just putting it out there because we like to share ideas and we like to share what we're, we're all doing. But everyone kind of has this attitude of like someone else is taking care of that. That, you know, oh, obviously that, that, that project is getting money from somebody, right? It's like when you scream fire and everyone assumes someone else called 911. <laughs> it's like, it's not actually that, that case. And as far as solutions here, actually, I'm not, I'm open to anything anyone has to suggest, by the way. <laughs> we've talked about partnerships, we've talked about, um, you know, better ways to fundraise, more services that we can offer, um, just trying to figure out what is the right way to do this. But I also think that the relationships between the open source projects and corporate sponsorships has always been a tenuous one. Um, in a lot of cases, the budgets that we our people have to support open source projects or events like this come out of marketing budgets, which tend to get slashed when there are contractions in the economy. Um, so even if we have champions within engineering groups, we have people who are very much advocates for everything that is going on in that project, they may not necessarily be the decider of who can use that money or have it in their budget for them to be able to contribute to that project. It'll usually get deferred back over to, to a marketing team. There's also turnover, right? So we may have a really, really good relationship with one particular company, and then somebody else comes in and has a completely different view of the world, and they decide that there's no longer something that they want to support. Um, over on the institutional sponsors, you have the other side of things, right? Where like Sloan Foundation, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation are all really active and they're fantastic. But also those grants, um, there are a couple of different things going on here, right? Getting a grant can be very, very hard, especially for people who are not used to writing grants, first off. <laughs> Um, second off, you need a grant administrator, administrator, so it does have to go through a fiscal entity. For example, NumFocus, <laughs> we do a lot of grant administration. Um, but then also, they tend to be very feature-oriented, right? That it's driving something forward and not necessarily always about maintaining the project. Things like documentation, tech debt, like, um, you know, basically uh, refactoring things, all of these things like that usually are not going to be the best, you know, uh, proposals for you to put out there. That's not the big sexy new feature that they want to fund and have their name on and then to move a project forward. So, and then there's also a scaling issue here, right? If you have a smaller project with like six maintainers on it and like, and you don't need all that much money, probably gonna get looked over for one of the larger ones. They like to send it in much, much bigger chunks, basically. But then you also, on the other side of here, and trust me, tell me to stop if I'm just going on too much, but um, we have this trend going on right now where companies are being built around open source projects, which seems to be a relatively sustainable way for things to work, where you're actually pulling in money. So there is this for-profit you know, support behind an open source project. The problem here is that that usually means that that company is controlling the complete roadmap of that project. So you have the situation, is that really open source? Is that really community driven? Is it still within the same vein of what's going on here? Even if it is more sustainable, that that way you actually do have money coming in. And what should that look like? Um, one of the other things that I also just wanted to bring up is that a lot of people have been talking about, um, you know, how can we, try to get people to contribute back. And so, first off, I think that one that I'm always talking to companies about is paying developers out of their own pocket to work on open source projects. Even if it's just a couple days a week, this is a huge win. So they're taking care of their benefits and 401k and they have you know career advancement and management and all of these things like that, but then they also do have the work that's happening on the projects themselves which is a really, really nice and weighs a very, very huge in-kind donation. Giving money directly, like I said, can be very challenging, so doing something like that is a very good thing to do. But um, uh, the other thing I also want to mention is that a lot of people within the community lately have been talking about, are there licensing changes that we can make, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
This is coming up more and more and more. The more conferences I go to and the more conversations I'm having, especially since I mentioned before, data science is big business. <laughs> like People are making a ton of money off of these things, and we have projects that are you know, scrounging for change in a lot of ways. So what is the way that we can almost force responsibility back? Um, and does that require some sort of licensing change in order to do that? And what would that look like? Um, because it is hard to find people that just out of the goodness of their heart are willing to you know, put this out there and not even necessarily because you're looking for name recognition or you want to look like the good guy. You know, there are a lot of companies that want to do the absolute bare minimum necessary for them to look like they are a good actor in the open source community, which is unfortunate. Um, and of course, we're you know, very grateful for anything that's coming in, but it's also not really within the spirit of you know, the community and how we want to create a vibrant, sustainable community. So um, with that, I will stop there. I was going to say, I was going to say one question for you was, um, uh, you kind of made me think of foundations. Yep. Uh, how do, would they play a part in this or, or not? Because there's also, there's a lot of different institutions, Linux, Linux Foundation, Apache, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, do they do any better than someone like uh, commercial entities such as myself? <laughs> um, just kind of thinking, yeah, do you think they have a role to play in to help standardize and push things in a certain way? Or should all open source projects be trying to push towards a foundation type model? Or i um, just curious. Well, I mean, this is why NumFocus was created, right? So that people could get paid to do open source. That you do have, we hold the bank accounts for people and do all the, you know, back end work for um, projects so that they are able to focus on the technology, right? It's all the stuff that nobody wants to think about on the back end, um, which is amazing. You think about it, it's a bit of a revolutionary idea that you have a community driven, you know. I'm not a business person. I'm not a back of the office person. I am a geek. I am a PhD in computer science who is like a software developer. <laughs> and having something that is community driven, people who are contributors to projects actually run some sort of institution that does this, I think is actually a huge revolution. And I'm not going to dog on other, you know, foundations or anything like that, but you know, the Linux Foundation is a for-profit entity, okay? <laughs> The Apache Foundation doesn't run the same way that NumFocus does. They have the ability to be a fiscal sponsor, but it's not something, it's not really a responsibility that they want or that they actually use. I have a so, question. Yeah. Yeah, so about the, you talked a little bit about the licensing yeah. kind of things going on. And one kind of thought that always crosses my mind is this idea of begging for money doesn't ever, doesn't seem sustainable in any way this seems like that's the modality that's like one modality of like either getting grants get up sponsors you name it all of that kind of falls under begging for money and i don't ever see that being a situation where people can thrive long term there might be some ask like people out there that get lucky but yeah like what is your opinion on licensing is that a promising avenue is there a way to kind of what do you, is, is that going to get traction? Uh, I am what do you think? dubious of the licensing thing. That just sounds like, you know, pushing things into the legal system is not really the best way that we necessarily, I, I don't believe in funding becoming punitive, right? <laughs> that this is, uh, I don't think that this is the right way to go. And that's my personal opinion, by the way. So I'm just going to throw that out there. That's a very Katrina opinion. How, how can we stop begging? <laughs> in like, begging means like, you know, all forms of begging, asking for donations, uh, asking for grants, you know, anything like that. Like, how can we, like, is it, yeah, and do you have an opinion on that as a found, being a foundation? Yeah, I mean, because we do, I don't like to think of myself as a beggar, but <laughs> I mean, uh, we solicit funds from a lot of different sources in order to help out projects um, as much as possible and try to put the projects out in front as much as possible. But we also do have you know, our own overhead running NumFocus in order to be able to do all of these things that we're doing. Um, but you, know, you do see the really, really successful projects, you know, it goes back to that relationship I was talking about that like, if you have company backing behind an open source project, you know, it tends to be much more stable, <laughs> but you then have to, at the expense 
of possibly, possibly the community or any kind of roadmap, right? Or is that such a bad thing, right? Because then you have, you tend to have a whole lot of developers all coming to that same company, right? So it could still be a cross-pollination of ideas. It's just all within one financial entity. But I am open to any and all suggestions, by the way, of how we can get more money into the open source community, 100%. Does anyone have anything else to add? I was going to say the or the the competitive. So my uh, uh, running a company. Uh, so if you don't like the Hamilton project, since it's open source, you can fork it. If you don't like our roadmap, so uh, I haven't seen too many instances of that occurring in the wild. Uh, since I do think there is a bit of friction to it, but um, being uh, you know here at this conference, you know we definitely do want to uh, push ideals in terms of you know building a community. Since uh, you know. Uh, I believe you know Hamilton will outlast my company very easily, um, uh, in so which case uh, you know I definitely want to kind of uh, uh, you know encourage that. And so oh no, I've thought of things of like how could I show that? And I was like you know would it could I show a badge on my repo that we subscribe to some some sort of values? Um, I don't know if anyone actually has that or does that. I don't know. Or, that is something we have been discussing. It actually came up just this morning that this is something we've talked about for years that I think would be an amazing thing to be able to say, you know, numfocus approved, you know, or that, you know, that there's criteria that's being met in order to be able to have that kind of badge. I think it would go a long way. We're going to get our blue check marks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because I, mean, I was going to say, like, with open source, one of the hardest things for adoption is actually awareness, right? And so uh, where my mind goes with this, if you have a, a curated list, uh, right, and then you teach people to go to these lists, then, you know, it's a re reinforcing mechanism, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that it would be amazing. I, You know, I think, I think that we've gotten pretty good at kind of the basics of what we're doing, right? And those are the... I, I also just want to mention on the educational initiative is another thing that I think that we would like to move into as well. So not just having, you know, corporate sponsorships or, you know, corporate badges and things like that, but also having partnerships with universities that, you know, um, I, I think myself, like a lot of other open source developers, you know, we were graduate students working on our research and we decided to open source all of the things that we were working on as part of our research. And that's how we got involved in the open source community. So, but then you graduate and you get a mortgage and you have a, draw, a job and you join the brain drain of a full time job. And um, suddenly the project kind of becomes much more brittle. Um, so having the ability to also support students, support you know this as an avenue for a career, I think is an important thing as well. Not to mention the fact that you know money coming in through you know educational areas. I, I think that this is just a really good conduit. You know the the users of tomorrow are the people that are in schools today. That's one of the reasons that open source is so popular within universities right now is because it's freely available so students can take advantage of it. So the hope is, of course, that these are gonna become the champions of open source when they leave. But we just keep running into the same sort of obstacles once, once they get out. I was at a, a different panel um, a few months ago and uh, um, they were talking about, one of, the, one of the panelists was talking about a course that they teach in the um, university on how to contribute to open source. So we just talked about funding and how funding can help maintainers stay involved and the other thing you need for an open source project uh, to help it continue is you can get resources via contributors. So what are some ways we can make it easier for people to contribute to open source? I know myself, when I was a junior developer, it was so daunting to um, start to contribute to open source. It was just something that like, you, you show up and it's like, oh, everyone already has this figured out. Uh, the secret handshake is already there. How do I do this? And so it felt like a really big barrier of entry. So what are some ways we can uh, encourage con contributions to projects? Yeah, I think um, con contributing new projects, um, I just have a concrete suggestion is to write documentation. That's the best way to contribute to a project. Um, maintainers really love it. 
you learn about the project and yeah, like people generally won't say no to that. Um, yeah, and if, yeah, you'll learn a lot about sort of what that project is and you'll build trust and move on to other things, but I think it's a great way. So I got started. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that. That is exactly the advice I give to everybody when they ask me how to join a project. It's like, if you do documentation, you'll become everybody's best friend immediately. And they will remember your name, and then when you want to start actually contributing, not only are you familiar with the code base after you've done all this documentation, but everyone will also trust you more when your pull request comes through. Right. The other thing I did want to mention also is that a lot of projects have first time contributor guides. Look for those. They're amazing. And a lot of co and other projects, I, I really love the projects that tag um, issues that are really good for first timers. They'll have, you know, like a newbie tag on it or, you know, like a first time contributor tag on it or something like that. Those are the ones that are going to be very welcoming. Or the ones that like know that this issue is one that probably someone who hasn't contributed before are going to be in there because I'll tell you, you know, 20 years of me contributing to open source projects, you gotta have a pretty thick skin sometimes when those, uh, you know, um, contributions come in there. So finding the projects that are kind, finding the ones that are very open, the ones that have the guides, the ones that have the um, tags, things like that, are probably the ones that you're gonna look for. And that goes for the projects as well, is that if you do want more contributors, create those things, create those avenues for people to come in. Um, I think that there's one thing that is also important when creating documentation, and it's about thinking who you are creating documentation for. And um, I was actually talking about this today, uh, that documentation nowadays, it's kind of a hard thing with the audience that we have. Like nowadays, no one's gonna read a book, no one's like actually takes the time to maybe like read through a whole website. So. If we really want to actually target the people who are going to start contributing to our open source libraries tomorrow, we need to think about what kind of content they want to see and how do they want to learn. Because nowadays, people are learning very differently than they were 10 years ago. And the documentation that we have for our open source libraries, most of them are already like very out today. Uh, in terms of how they are built, like nowadays, people do tutorials. They do like 30 second TikTok videos where they teach how to do a PR on GitHub. And that's what people are actually using to learn. And as open source maintainers, we actually have to start thinking about that. And it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's gonna be really hard because that sort of content, it's probably more difficult to sustain than like regular documentation. But if we really want to help people to actually know how to contribute to open source and learn how to use our libraries, we need to think about how we write documentation. And the, like, yeah, nowadays, I would say videos, TikToks, GIFs, screenshots, um, hands-on tutorials, and that, that would be like the, the, the one thing I would say that it's super important right now to think about. Yeah, I was going to say, I've been thinking about video documentation. Um, the one thing for getting started, I think, uh, for me is like the, the, the number of steps should be as minimal as possible. So if you have a script that you could collapse a bunch of steps together, write that script. There's nothing, nothing more daunting than me than looking at like, I'm, oh, this is going to take 15 steps for me to set up. Can't it just be one, right, or two, right? And so, um, uh, and, and so that, that's... That has stopped me from contributing or, or, or uh, you know, working on a project. It's just the setup required to get started. So you might have great documentation, but if it's like you know, 10 steps, I'm just like, sorry, I don't have that time. Yeah. You've been thinking about video documentation? Do you think it's a good idea? Uh, well, um, maybe not. I mean, it depends on the contributor. I mean, for users, I think it's kind of uh, to, to the point of people are consuming things differently. Uh, if you can concisely pitch something in a minute or two, like and get people over the hump to like to to, to try. It. I think I don't know. Um, just walking through someone showing it visually, I think is kind of interesting. I don't know. This is um, yeah. Since we're virtual, right? You're not you're not next to someone sitting sitting and seeing what they were doing on screen. Maybe that's you know uh, having someone uh, show you is 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 you know. Uh, can you, you could say your activation energy lowers your activation energy since you don't have to read, you can just consume. But I don't know, that's, that's something that um, I think, you know, if you have telemetry on your docs, could be something to test, but I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Like uh, PyTorch Lightning has like a video on each like function and method. And it makes me a little bit nervous. Like, oh, how do you maintain this? Because like you change something, we're going to like, re-record now. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting. We're, we're all content creators. Yeah, maybe we should actually do documentation on how to build documentation because we really need to learn how to do documentation that is actually relevant to like nowadays targets. I just want to mention that everyone thinks they do documentation better than everybody else, and that's why we don't have any kind of consensus here. So I, I just think it's really funny because everyone's just like, this is the right way to do it. And then, you know, all it's going to do is also, by the way, just create... 15 other people to create their own TikToks to tell you all the reasons you're wrong. <laughs> so the question that comes to mind when we talk about documentation, which we've talked about quite a bit, um, is with Copilot or you know, ChatGPT, what is the impact on writing documentation going forward where we have uh, some assistant whatever it might be, some AI assistant who is potentially reading the documentation for us or generating that documentation. And so like, what is the, and this will segue into it. The next thing we can just kind of roll into is like, what is the impact on um, Copilot's AI in open source? Yeah, um, so I think it's a really interesting question. Um, as far as, so like I'm, because of MB Dev and things like that, I think that I'm I, I'm really subscribed to the literate programming sort of ideology, which is your programs should be, you know, meant to be read by the user, and like writing documentation should be part of your software development workflow itself. Because um, I find that when I write software, if I if it becomes a lot better when I'm documenting it at the same time. And what that means is often I'll be I'll write something and then I go to write documentation for it at the same time and I'll realize, hey, this is really bad. I, I don't want to document this. And then I'll, re I'll rewrite that thing. And that happens quite a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that so that's one aspect like Copilot might help with that. But I think there is a larger issue of like right now. The way Copilot is is this kind of like assuming your programming environment is like fixed in Copilot. It's bringing Copilot, bringing large language models into those IDEs. But I think like there's a lot of room for your IDEs to change to accommodate a large language models. So fundamentally, like your software development workflow fundamentally changing. Um, so yeah, there's some ideas. If you want to know like concrete example, you can Google RoboWeb is a good example. It's like a Jupyter notebook with like a ChatGPT thing in it, um, like as a sidecar, and kind of like automatically go back and forth. Um, so I think there's a lot of other modalities, and like really we can rethink software development, like from the perspective of hey, we have this additional tool. I think we should like make use of it like as best as we can cuz if nowadays you can just like copy a uh, python code into chatgpt and ask what does it python code do and then chatgpt is going to output a perfectly viable answer then we should just take advantage of that to make our own things like better i mean writing documentation is probably going to become more easier due to these tools that we have available uh but Again, if, if uh, I don't know, an 18-year-old um, kid is going to try to figure out how to start using some libraries, he's probably not going to go to read the documentation. He's probably going to ask ChatGPT or maybe use some other resources that we have available that are more fun to watch, maybe. So I think we should like make use of these tools. But these are going to definitely um, make the education very different in the future. Okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and say, like, from what I've seen so far, the state that things are in right now, chat GPT is just really good at BSing, right? So 
I worry about all the really, really crappy, copious amounts of documentation that are going to be out there <laughs> that we're going to have to wade through that actually are wrong, um, first off. <laughs> okay. On the other hand, if anything gets me out of writing documentation, I'm, I'm pretty cool with that. So um, <laughs> if we can get this to a point that is really good. The, the thing that I also do worry about, and um, you know, maybe this is something that I shouldn't be worried about, but having an assistant write your code, I worry about innovation as a software developer, right? That, like you were talking about, is that it's assuming constant APIs. It's constant, you know, it's assuming a certain amount of consistency <laughs> over time, right? But if you're a library developer, right, who's having to clean interfaces, who's, you know, updating things to use different libraries that you are trying to, you know, use better practices in here, you're, you know, more maintainable code, more uh, scalable code, more, you know, updating to a newer version of something like that. Is that something that it's going to be able to do? Because, I mean, obviously we're training on things that have already been created, right? <laughs> What about all the things that are new? And that I don't see that you can necessarily get away 100% from a person just yet. And like, I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but you know, those are my two maybe more jaded opinions. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a different experience. I feel like I'm able to be a lot more ambitious and kind of do projects I wouldn't think about because of Copilot. Um, like, you know, I've started making VS Code extensions, and I've never really, I yeah, I was able to, like, make a VS Code extension, like, within two or three hours, uh, like a like a meaningful one. Um, and we had no, without any, really, that, like, any prior experience with TypeScript. Um, you know, and things like that, like, or, like, Chrome extensions or various other things. And I... Yeah, I feel, and even with Python projects, I feel like with the thoughtful sort of interaction, I'm able to guide it. Now, yeah, there'd be like lazy people out there that probably just ship the code that, you know, is there. But yeah, I feel like it's a powerful tool for me uh, so far. I think actually um, that we could use that in our favor for innovation, because like, if we can delegate this more basic automatic tasks to like this sort type of robot and we can focus on the innovative part of whatever we want to do, then maybe it actually help us do things faster, right? Like what you were saying. Um, if, if I want to do like a new project or whatever and maybe I don't have to put like a lot of time to things that I already know how to do and someone else can do them for me and I can just think of the how to make this new, how to make this impactful, how to make this. So I, I think that it can also be used uh, in our advantage in that sense. Yeah, uh, so largely agree. I think I'm still learning how to use it best, but yeah, you, if you can use it to be to increase your efficiency, right? Whether it's to you know spend less or more time on on, on certain things, but yeah, I, I can see it helping create documentation. What I'm more excited about is you know when someone creates an issue or has a question that it can give them an answer, so when, uh, or, or auto suggesting the fix even to go back into your project. Like that, that's kind of where where I could see it being useful. But then there's the question of who pays for the compute, you know, but but otherwise, maybe that's a funding question, but yeah. Yeah, one person that I recommend reading about or following is Simon Willison. He's like a notable Python programmer, creator of Django and Dataset, and all these other projects. But he writes a lot about how he uses uh, Copilot and ChatGPT in his pers in his workflow. And he's, he's pretty detailed about it. So yeah, I actually learned a lot, like got a lot of ideas by kind of reading what he does closely. I actually don't remember if we had 60 minutes or more than, <laughs> we have what? 90, 90 minutes. Okay, um, so I, I don't think we'll use the whole 90 minutes. It's been 60 minutes. Um, Hamill was like, I don't know how we're gonna talk for 60 minutes and here we are at 60 minutes and he's still talking. Um, so I wanna open it up and see if there are any questions. Uh, on any of the topics or other topics from the audience, we can do a few questions and then maybe wrap it up. 
I'll start with Jim over here. Sorry, I see it very much as a collective action problem, right? So this is a well-known problem, right? A well-known problem space. We have tragedy of the commons. We know open SSL. We all know this story. And I, I, I jokingly said blue mark, blue check mark, but Twitter is a commons, right? And he's exploiting it, right? He's, he's basically saying you're getting value out of this commons. We can't do it in such a way that every individual is for themselves, so we're treating it as a collective problem. I think the check mark is not a bad one for non-focus. That's my take on it. But do you have opinions on it as a collective action problem? How do we solve those? We're not very good at it as a species, I don't think. How do you price it? That's my question. I mean, look, you know, I mean, let me give you throw something out there, right? Uh, number of downloads from non-focus. Non, non if I, I want to do it, uh, if, if somebody at some large organization downloads more than some, so many every day, they certainly have to start paying. Right, and now suddenly you're going to get big companies that are going to start have to pay a bit, and then you can adjust that or whatever. But it's like, you know, I think I think if we think about it in those terms, and people are talking about a lot of the problems we have in those terms, then we can come up with some solutions. Yeah, I would like to see open source maintainers thrive, not just be quote sustainable. You know, so the, the like notion of sustainable is like kind of this word that implies that you're you're okay. But I don't think that's good enough because I think open source maintainers a lot of times gain a lot of value. Should be able, to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, so like, um, I would like to figure out, yeah, a system where people can move beyond just sustaining, but to thriving somehow. Yeah. I was just going to say, I would love for the projects to thrive 100%. <laughs> I think that sustainable right now is actually a really good place to start, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, uh, there's a question that has to do with the usage of ChatGPT. Um, have, uh, are you all familiar with the paper about stochastic parrots, the one that says on the, lar on the dangers of large stochastic parrots, that one? Yes. Um, given that we, uh, given that we know all the stories of how there's so many bugs out there that are uh, and so much bad code in production, um, I know. Feel free to refute me on that and tell me about whether that's a serious a problem. I, as I think it is, but. Um, how would you um, how would you advise uh, open source contributors, especially new ones, to use that? Uh, because um, because like just copy pasting from ChatGPT kind of relies on the assumption that um, whatever code is out there is already good code. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think there's a really powerful way to use ChatGPT, which is to say. Please explain this code to me. What are the trade-offs of this? Why did you do it this way? What are some other things I should think about? That's the way I use ChatGPT. Like, I ask, like for you know, I describe the problem I'm trying to solve. It gives me some code. If it's a kind of a more complex kind of problem, I will ask a lot of introspective questions, and then get ideas for things that I might want to search independently. And it kind of, I don't. Yeah, I think the wrong way to use it is just to blindly copy and paste code and like put it in some code because it's really yeah, it's not you're not growing um, necessarily that way. And yeah, just ask a lot of questions about the code itself. Um, and you know, sometimes ask it, is there another way to do this? And just like really, kind of being still you're still being a student, but kind of like understanding like. Once you like uh, practice that idea, I think it's very powerful. You can learn a lot faster, and that's what the, that's like the best way. I, that I mean, that's the way I use it. And I think, yeah. What are the odds of an open source library landing on ChatGPT, especially given like contributions? Or if if you want to ask, uh, okay, explain how uh, explain how this um, SSK learn open source. Yes. Okay. Explain how this uh, line in SKLearn works. 
um, versus uh, uh, versus some obscure project that um, that has like five contributors. I did an experiment uh, three weeks ago, and I wrote some code that used Biwax, which is uh, open sourced in 2022, and uh, Rerun, which is open sourced in 2023. And I wrote this code, and I was like, oh, I don't want to write a blog post, but I need to write a blog post. So I just took chunks of the code, and I was like, let's see what comes out of this thing. And I <clears throat> asked questions of ChatGPT. GPT about it and like asked asked it to like write um, or explain different parts of the code to me and it did a really really good job and it had no clue what the the library was and so I think that there's like I don't know it was maybe hallucinating in a really good way but um, the blog post I then posted and it's it's on our website and um, it was like one of the most successful ones <laughs> unfortunately but. Uh, it's just really interesting that um, what Hamill was saying is like if you're if you use some like critical thinking as part of your uh, engagement with it, you can actually like peel through the layers of what's going on in an understanding way. I'm not sure whether your question was getting at it, but um, you made me think of licensing with respect to what ChatGPT outputs. Um, I don't know whether that's an issue anyone's thought of, but if you're training on open source, right, it has a particular license. Uh, and so if something, say, like HGPL3 uh, and JetGPT verbatim takes some code out of it, did it, you know, are you in breach of that license? That was actually what I was going to bring up, is that there's a big question here about attribution in general. And I think sometimes people forget that code is protected under copyright, just as is, like, a work, a book that is written by an author and the same laws apply to it right and so what there's a big question open right now already about when you know books are going to be written by chat gpt how do you attribute that back to the original authors that were used obviously if something is within the style of something what do you do there and along with that by the way i do want to bring up the idea of liability and security as well, right? Who is liable, right, for that code when it's out there if it creates some sort of security issue or if there is some sort of, I mean, all kinds of things can happen in code. We've all seen this. Um, there have been, you know, huge data breaches. There have been huge uh, catastrophic failures of different things within open source communities. And especially, um, you know, not to go too far off into a tangent, but with some of the, you know, legislation that's up in Europe, which will end up applying to us in the United States, which we saw with GDPR, um, this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue when we do have assistance helping us write code. I think these are all open questions of like, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? And how are we going to be able to attribute and, and handle all these things? We don't necessarily want to <laughs> spend all of our time in court we want to create cool things. We want to build cool technology. Um, so uh, I don't have an answer to it, but I do think that this is going to be a bigger and bigger question as we move down this road very, very quickly. I, I do, hi there. I, I do have a question. And um, given your experience in open source for a lot of years, do you feel like um, the community has changed and now is taking a lot for granted open sources. And I'm asking you this because we can see a lot of packages now changing also the licensing uh, exactly because of that. Uh, and I wanted to know your opinion. Me personally, I think that there, you are seeing kind of a shift. I think, um, well, not to get too much into my keynote tomorrow, but uh, you know, I think sometimes we do have to kind of remember where we came from in order to understand why we're doing this. Why does this matter? And what are the guideposts and what are the you know philosophies behind why we continue to do it this way? And uh, I, I just, I, I think that a lot of people are tired, right? <laughs> uh, maintainers burn out all the time. You know, I, I know that there have definitely been times where I've looked at an issue and I'm just like, God, why am I doing this? I'm not even getting paid for this. Um, whereas other people could be coming actually from a business that's making money off this package that are the ones asking for the support, right? And um, I, 
I do think that there is a shift happening right now. And I don't, I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I do think that people have become a little bit more, um, I guess, fed up in some cases, and in other cases, maybe even a little mercenary. Yeah, oh, I mean, I was going to add to that was that I think the uh, the cloud providers have actually I think been a pretty big reason for the shift in licenses, right? Uh, since you had things like Elastic that came up with their own new ones, right? Um, and and then partly because yeah, they they're, uh, they're at such a scale that they're you know, making lots of money off of this open source stuff. So I think you know because of as the, as they have gotten bigger, I think it's become a bigger problem. And that's another example of a company, right, that was built around an open, which was a fork, by the way, of an Apache project, right? And so that was, uh, um, I don't know if anybody else was around when that happened, but <laughs> it, was a, it was kind of a big deal. And because um, the other, you know, what it was forked from died on the vine, right? Whereas Elastic was able to build a company around it and remain sustainable. And so um, anyway, I'll stop. Uh, yeah, thank you. My, my question is actually about uh, the similar topic, but from the other way around. So like how to build an open source project as a company the right way? Uh, because that's what we're trying to do. And, and actually, you know, we've been uh, refused to become an associated project at NumFocus last year for specifically this reason, because, you know, most of the contributors come from the same company and, and, and things like that. And, and it makes total sense. But... Uh, I'm just trying to understand uh, what, you know, what's the right way uh, to, to, do, to do all this. We, we give all our technology out there for free. Uh, we, we are happy to take, obviously, contributions. We get a lot of really valuable contributions from people in the community. Uh, I get a lot of feedback. We get a lot of feedback on how to improve what we do. So it seems like a healthy uh, relationship with the community. But uh, still, as you mentioned, it's sort of like a, a grayish zone there and, and and I'm just trying to understand how to how to do things properly here to fit the culture. Well, I mean there's the question of properly then there's the criteria for being an affiliated project as part of NumFocus, right? Um, these are not necessarily the same things. I'm just gonna say it, right? That there are a lot of different ways to do open source all the way all along the scale. And you know, obviously I'm very, very uh, involved in NumFocus and things like that, but I'm involved in a lot of open source things outside of NumFocus as well. And I just want to mention that, you know, I agree that there that does seem very healthy. That seems like a really great way to run a project and keep it, you know, running and all of those things like that. But I think that especially for a, a, a community like NumFocus really is about building community. It has that community-driven aspect of it. And that's why I think that that is an important part of the criteria of becoming part of that larger community, right? And so, and especially in the sense that being a fiscal, you know, sponsor of different projects, you know, if we, we shouldn't be the fiscal entity for a project that is backed by a company, right? <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I, I just want to mention that, that, that like, you're not doing anything wrong right, by doing this. I think it's a fantastic thing to do. But as being part of a NumFocus project, being within the mission of NumFocus, making sure that it's in accordance with the same values that NumFocus is trying to push forward, that is a criteria that was added um, in order to be able to ensure that it is community driven. I was going to say, part of it depends on who your target end users are a little, since uh, I think someone else internally in another company using you for commercial purposes, like you driving it and them getting that value out of it, sounds fine. Uh, but, you know, for other people who are just doing it for side projects and want to, you know, better themselves as part of the community, like, they have different incentives, right? And so they might not want to contribute if you're the only one driving it. Um, uh, or at least, you know, that's some of the feedback that I've been kind of, you know, given. Um, in terms of, you know, starting a company around open source, which I'm doing myself, like a contentious thing with uh, uh, founders, or at least that you, get, you get pretty different takes, is do you name the company the same as the project or have it very, or have it very separate and distinct? 
right? Um, so some some would argue you want them both together to like you know because you want to be the community and have that confused. But I think you know that leads to confusion within the community as what is open source and what is closed source sometimes. So I think there's there's two different ways of, of thinking about yeah how do you name things to really keep the the community side separate from the commercial side. And so there's different takes there. You know where of the opinion. So Dagworks is you know very different brand from Hamilton, which is the open source side. Uh, but there's other people like you know DBT being a famous example. They actually changed their name to be DBT just to like ca capitalize on, on on the open source side of things. So uh, that that is something to I, know, I think we'll see play out over the, the next few years as to which way is the better way. But my assumption is that if you really want your community, you really want to have its own branded identity that's different from from your company. I just want to add that I do think that this goes back to our earlier conversation that NumFocus, you know, we do. We want to explore other avenues to be a part of the community, right? That it's not necessarily always, you know, the avenues we have set up right now. And so um, it's an ongoing conversation. I just wanted to say that I don't think there's like a correct way of doing like an open source library. It actually depends on what your purpose is. And if you are building your project for the community, then a good way to evaluate if you are doing it right or wrong would be actually seeing what's the response of the community, of your users, of your target um, with your library. Like there's, I don't know, there's surveys. If, if you have a, actually open contributions, what are people saying on GitHub? What are the issues? What are they talking about? Um, like if you want to create a more like active community around it, then social media engagement, and what are they saying on Twitter about your library? Are they talking about it like good stuff? And that's like a way to see uh, whether you're doing it right or wrong, but I, I don't think there's like a right way to do open source. It actually means on what goal are you, are you looking for when you're building your project. So it's certainly possible to uh, get funding for the scientific uh, Python um, ecosystem because anacondas managed to do it, right? <laughs> That's their business model. So is that something that NumFocus would consider? Because there's definitely things that enterprises would want, like secure supply chain uh, support and so on, that seem like if they were, you know, if, if NumFocus was supplying those things, potentially they could get those longer term non-marketing department uh, dependent sources of funding. Sure, so what Anaconda is, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say this as a former Anaconda employee, right? So I, I can go ahead and put that spin on this whole thing is that, you know, Anaconda is actually, you know, an incredibly good actor in the, in the community. And um, even to the point, I don't think this is any big uh, surprise or anything, but Anaconda actually gives a percentage of their money back to NumFocus every quarter. So this is something that, you know, they've, chosen to do because it's part of that collective that they are, you know, incubating. They incubate so many projects there. Um, but it it has been tenuous, actually, at times, right? It hasn't always been quite as simple as, you know, building this company around it and, you know, everything just works out beautifully or anything like that. But I, I think that, you know, one of the nice things about Anaconda, obviously, is that Peter is a true believer. Like, he is 100% behind this. Um, so that makes it a lot easier. <laughs> I would love if other companies decided to move in that same direction. But it was voluntary on their part, right? Um, that's not something that we solicited. So um, I, I don't know how to encourage that with other companies right now. I, if you have any suggestions, I would love to hear it. <laughs> Hi, I had a follow-up question on the licensing and like how kind of the corporations use all of the packages that are, you know, free. Um, a lot of the kind of new features that they're asking for and like driving for, like is there a way to have that be kind of more pay to play? Because I'm hearing you guys saying like, I don't want to do this feature for this kind of like nondescript company that's just going to make money off of it. So like, why not just say no or attach a dollar value. I mean, it depends when you draw the line on the features you're adding to the project, probably. I mean, when early on, every feature you add to the project, you want to be used by a lot of people, so there's a lot more utility added for each like amount of energy expended. 
So at some point, you've added all these super, you know, uh, features that can be used by a lot of the community when someone comes along and asks for one particular feature. It might be that you've already, I don't know, it could be that there are so many other people adding it. But I think uh, the support and roadmap selling is something that's done by companies today. I mean, I think that's a, a business model. I mean, I think Red Hat uh, kind of pioneered and was successful in um, selling support around open source and selling features. Um, you could fork your open source project and make it completely different on your platform. And there's many ways to do it, but you'll still be deemed probably as evil by the maximalist open source community potentially. I mean, HashiCorp built a very successful open core business. We've all used their open source products, probably all of us here. Um, but as soon, you know, because they lead the roadmap, they're deemed as an evil corporation behind an open source product. There's no real, I think there's still a lot of problems in the licensing today because you have a definition of what open source is based on the license. <clears throat> you can't always, uh, the value that you create, you cannot always capture that. And so the business might not exist or it exists in a way that's deemed, you know, not open source anymore. So, yeah, there are many ways to do it, but not all of them work for sure. Yeah, they, they stopped becoming open source at some point. I mean, so people, uh, I mean, uh, you see a lot more GitHub repos now with like licenses actually sub, different directories of different licenses and stuff. And so that's something you need to pay attention to. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's something, you know, I've been thinking about as well. You know, like how do you, how do you li license something such that, you know, uh, uh, if someone wants to take it to production commercially, like, you know, there should be some limits or other things uh, in regard. And so, um, but yeah, no, I think we'll, we'll see what, what sticks in five years or so. If the com but I mean, if the company dies, the open source project's still there. I think in the current economic environment, we'll see many companies that probably uh, aren't going to live up to the promise of what they're going to be around their open source community, and they might not grow into what they were promising, these like commercial open source companies. So we're still witnessing like a change in what the business model will be. We don't, you know, it's not a like cut and dry thing today. I mean, just to add to that, I mean, that's one of the reasons that we want to have more than one uh, entity involved in a project as part of NumFocus is that, I mean, sustainability is not just about money, it's about being able to move forward. So if people, you know, if a company fails, which, you know, happens all the time, does that project go away, right? It's almost as just as bad as somebody graduates with their PhD and then they go away, right? We still want to have those mechanisms in place in order for something to move forward. Actually, there, I have seen uh, there's some licenses that you know aren't open source. So I think Maria DB has one where effectively they say it's open code. Uh, you can't use it for production, but in four years it becomes open source. Source available. Yeah, source. That, available. by the way, is incredibly uh, um, uh, controversial <laughs> right now. Okay. It's not. It's not technically open source yeah, yeah, yeah. until it becomes Apache or 2.0 or MIT or whatever copy lab. A whole other hour and a half. Yeah. But it happened because the clouds were taking advantage of um, software and they were not contributing back. Yeah, but yeah, and then um, also, you know, if you're going to stick a thing on a company and you're small, being having the code as open source is kind of a, an insurance policy, right? And so, in which case, I think that's the other the other angle of that license. So at the very beginning, what you're looking for is maximum adoption. There's a certain number of, there are companies out there that have like a uh, software supply chain do not use list and it might include some of that, um, some of those licenses. So if you want maximum penetration and adoption of your software, you're gonna end up using MIT or some super permissive license and, and that kind of, you know, you, you end up in this same situation. And that, you know, the free software movement versus open source is always kind of a gray area. People get confused a lot. Open source, for sure, that term of art was actually, you know, it's very pragmatic. 
that that idea of like you know free and fair use maximum adoption like you were talking about it's kind of a middle ground and um yeah and but once again you put something out into the wild you get to choose your license <laughs> choose your own destiny it's all good <laughs> me no like i just um you know it depends on you know the threat is to money right <laughs> that's completely separate from uh whether or not something is open source in my mind right so you know when people talk about competitions and threats and all of these things like that i truly do go back to you know the idea of like the whole idea is to get ideas out there <laughs> and so um yeah I'll, that's my short answer, I guess. I mean, it might kill some startups. That's about it. Thanks. Um, going back to the uh, chat GPT and Copilot uh, topic. So a couple of you mentioned, you know, that just copying and pasting what it generates is a terrible idea, and I totally agree with you. Um, on the other hand, thousands, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of developers a day do exactly the same thing um, from Stack Overflow, right? They just copy and paste. Has has anyone studied, you know, is the quality of code you get by copying and pasting from one any better or worse than the other? Or, you know, is is ChatGPT trained enough on the on uh, Stack Overflow that it's the same exact stuff? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's always bad to copy and paste from ChatGPT. There's a lot of low stakes code out there, like, you know, stuff I want to automate for myself or something. I don't know. It's like so, like, there's so many people out there just want to rename a directory of Excel files or something. It's like easy to verify. So, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, like, I, I wouldn't like make a blanket statement like, okay, you should never copy and paste code. Um, it's, it's like the same thing, the same goes for Stack Overflow code. Like I think people copy and paste Stack Overflow code mostly when it's like pretty, it's like a pretty scoped thing that they can easily verify if it's working and it makes sense. They, when they see it, they, they, they say, aha, that's exactly what I want. Um, it's kind of similar, like with Stack Overflow, you get like an explanation maybe and there's like comments about like, oh yeah, this edge case and this edge case gives you more confidence that works because it's like from humans and so somewhat verifiable or give, like just gives you more trust. But I think it's kind of similar in that way. Like you, you do want to copy and paste, but copy and paste and select situations. <laughs> That's my answer anyway. I think that my short answer is I have no idea which one is better, like, but, um, I honestly think that we should not say no to just like copy paste code because I think that there's even some like very experienced developers who are actually in Stack Overflow, like helping people writing their code, and it's like it's I think it's us who has have to do like the the homework of knowing what to trust and not like what to not trust. But in any case, if it's ChatGPT or if it's Stack Overflow, in both cases, we need to be cautious of what we're using and how we're using it. But um, I don't think it's like a hard no on copy pasting code because I think that I mean there there's gonna be a point in which we're gonna be able to do that from ChatGPT and it's gonna like maybe even be better than us like doing code. But at this point, it's just like a matter of caution and select what you use and how you use it. Just one more kind of, I think the right way to use Stack Overflow also is like to learn something. You know, it's like to say, oh, you see a piece of code, it's like, oh, why does it do that? Or what is that thing here that I don't understand? Um, you know, if you just, 
it's the same thing with chat GPT. It's like, but with chat GPT, you know, you have to put in the effort maybe to like write the question or like dig a little bit. Stack Overflow, maybe it's already there. Someone else has a question in the comments or something. So I think it's like, again, similar. Like you try to learn something is the idea. That's it. That's it. We're at time. We're at time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the panelists.